Today's podcast of Hellbent for Horror is brought to you by Audible.com. Get a free audiobook download and a 30-day free trial at audibletrial.com forward slash hellbent for horror. Audible has over 180,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or MP3 player. Hi, and welcome to Hellbent for Horror, a podcast devoted to all things related to horror. I'm S.A. Bradley, and I'm a lifelong movie lover, but my heart belongs to horror. My biggest thrill, however, is getting to talk to people about this stuff. I really want to start conversations with you. Now, there are some people I owe a warm thank you to for supporting Hellbent for Horror through my Patreon site. If you don't know, uh, Patreon is a crowdfunding site for people to support creators of all sorts of work. You can support the show by pledging a set amount for each episode I release. If I don't put out an episode, you don't get charged. And with that, thank you, Molly Burke, for your support. When you go on your next rampage on a full moon, I'll be your alibi for the police. I also want to thank Dan Schreffler for joining the Hellbent for Horror Horde. Dan, it takes a certain cultural sophistication to be a member of a horde, but I think you're up to the challenge. To show my sincere gratitude, when the Grim Reaper comes to collect you, I'll buy you some time by pointing him in the opposite direction. He falls for it every time. If you like Hellbent for Horror and you feel inspired to contribute, even as little as a dollar, it will really help me to continue to devote my time and effort to the show. And I've also got a book version of Hellbent for Horror in the works, and I'll be posting some of the work in progress on the Patreon site. I'll be interested in hearing your opinions. I've set up different support levels on my site, by the way, and there are little tokens of thanks at each of the levels. And that'll be from access to Patreon activity feeds, to monthly web hangouts where we can talk directly about horror, to limited edition Hellbent for Horror t-shirts. Yay! They come in the color black only. (laughs) The horror fan's official uniform, right? You can find my page at patreon.com and then search for Hellbent for Horror. I'll also have a direct link to it on my website. Also, there's all kinds of ways to support the show. You can write reviews of the show on iTunes and Stitcher. That helps the word get out to other horror fans, lets us grow. And for all that, hey, I thank you for your support. As a species, man has been obsessed with the idea of the other or the outsider since the first families became tribes and then claimed a spot of land as their own. And as soon as there was a community and a village, there became two worlds in here and out there in here was where there was security and shelter and the strength of numbers and out there deep in the woods was where all the danger was because out there was where the others lived and the others might be another tribe the others might be a horde of monsters either way those that were out there had one thing in mind they wanted to get in here and when the tribe gathered around the campfire at night the elders told scary stories of what was lurking in the darkness the moral was that everyone in the tribe needed to be on the lookout for that outsider which is probably the first horror story ever told. As a storytelling style, horror lends itself to the observation and discussion of the outsider. The most basic story is the one I just mentioned, where the outsider can be a stand-in for anything we fear. And I think it's that storyline that critics refer to when they label horror as reactionary. In other words, that horror tells us to fear and destroy anything that is different from us. And that type of horror film certainly does exist. But that critical viewpoint forgets something very important. Horror is an outsider art form. It is an art form created primarily by outsiders that is enjoyed by fans who are outsiders. And often... The best horror stories take the perspective of the outsider. How many of you identified with the Frankenstein monster when you were a kid? I know the monster scared me when I first saw him, but I also felt sorry for him. I not only empathized with the monster, but I could also relate to him. I related to how he was rejected and how he was hated when all he wanted to do was belong because he was different. 
And then there's H.P. Lovecraft's short story, The Outsider, where the narrator has been trapped alone in a dark dungeon for a long time, and he finally escapes. He climbs the stairs, and he finally finds people who scream and run when they see him. He looks in the mirror, and that's when he realizes that he is the monster of the castle. Both the Frankenstein monster and Lovecraft's outsider resonate with us so much because they remind us of every time we were rejected by our peers, every time we were left out of schoolyard games or when the popular kids mocked us, every time we were called weirdos and freaks and ate lunch by ourselves. And we were powerless. We were helpless to change it because the chief of the playground tribe marked us as the outsider and the tribe followed the leader. No kid was going to come to your rescue and risk getting marked too. We have a primal, instinctual need to belong. We are social creatures. And Goodhar examines the fear and the anxiety that comes from being an outsider. And Goodhar also examines how, very often, outsiders are created by the tribe. After all, you can't have outsiders without there being insiders. Back in the late 60s and early 1970s, Roman Polanski made a trilogy of horror films that took place almost entirely in the apartments of the main characters. The first one was Repulsion, where the apartment represented the deteriorating mind of the main character as she slowly went insane. Then there was Rosemary's Baby, where the apartment was like a womb that Rosemary Woodhouse was trapped in during her own pregnancy. And then there was The Tenant, the least known and least successful of these three movies. In The Tenant, the apartment building and its residents mirror a society where a select few use intimidation and fear to keep everybody else in line. And they get away with it because everyone is afraid that if they complain, they get marked. In the world of The Tenant, Available apartments in Paris are scarce and expensive, and because of that, everyone fears eviction. The landlord and the concierge have the power to make anyone who doesn't follow the rules into a literal outsider. But Polanski shows that the real horror isn't that these people have the power to impose their will on others. The real horror is that they get that power handed to them by the people that they dominate. Roman Polanski himself plays Tchaikovsky, a Russian living in Paris. Now, Polanski is a small man himself, and he plays Tchaikovsky as a shrinking man. He's the kind of person who apologizes for even speaking. He is meek and he is nervous, and other people respond to it by harassing him. He comes to the apartment building, which is an old villa with a central courtyard, and he's looking for a room. There is a possible vacancy coming, but the reason for its vacancy is ominous. The last tenant attempted suicide by jumping from the third story window. The landlord is elderly, and he is also a tenant. And from the very beginning, he is all veiled threats and intimidation. He lets Tchaikovsky know that he doesn't need his money, he could take it or leave it, but that he knows apartments are rare to find. What he wants are well-behaved tenants, and he won't think twice about evicting someone who makes noise, causes trouble, or brings girls around. But he can't rent the apartment until the other tenant either breaks her lease or dies, and she is hospitalized in critical condition. The current tenant does die, but not before Tchaikovsky visits her in the hospital. And we see her. She is bandaged head to toe, like a mummy. Only her eyes and her mouth are visible, and we notice that she's missing a front tooth. And when she sees Tchaikovsky, she starts screaming. The trouble starts as soon as Tchaikovsky moves into the apartment. He has some work friends over for a housewarming party, but his friends are really bullies. They are loud and obnoxious, and they move his furniture around. But he is so desperate for friends, he nervously allows it while he looks at how late it is on his watch. The retaliation of the landlord and the other tenants is swift. He receives his first and only warning from the landlord. Tchaikovsky promises it won't happen again. He doesn't receive guests anymore. 
and he's quiet as a monk in his apartment. And yet, the complaints keep coming from the other tenants. The angry neighbors constantly bang on his walls and his ceiling and his floor. Now, the landlord doesn't need to threaten Tchaikovsky. The other tenants do it for him. Every move Tchaikovsky makes is scrutinized and criticized. The more he tries to change his habits to suit them, the more disgusted they get with him. Simple chores, like taking out the garbage, are tinged with dread. And no matter what his actions are, it will be seen as wrong by his neighbors. But it's not just happening to him. One night, Tchaikovsky is awoken by a crying woman with her handicapped daughter, and she asks him why he filed a formal complaint against her. Tchaikovsky promises her he did no such thing. He doesn't even know her. And then, days later, a neighbor he's never met asks him to sign a petition to evict another tenant he doesn't know. When he says, hey, he doesn't want to be party to this, she turns ugly and threatening. I see the kind of person you are now. When you get what's coming to you, don't come running for help. If this were a prison, the tenants would be both the prisoners and the guards. And then, things get really strange. Trolkovsky is robbed, and they take most of his stuff. But, they leave an old dress from the former tenant. And then... Someone leaves a box of makeup and lipstick on his bed. And then he notices that people who use the communal toilet across the courtyard stand in the bathroom and stare out directly at him, at his window, for a long, long time. And then he finds a hole in his wall. When he investigates, he finds a human tooth wrapped in cotton. And the banging on the walls doesn't stop. And then someone tries to break in the front door. And then someone tries to break in the window. Now, The Tenant is a seriously messed up movie. It's Roman Polanski channeling Franz Kafka. It is surreal and full of absurd deadpan humor that reminded me of David Lynch films. But at the center of all this weirdness, the movie has this tremendous sense of dread that feels very real, very true, and very personal. This movie seems to be fueled by Polanski's self-hatred. Now, he's a controversial figure, to say the least, and there's plenty for people to hate, but it is also true that he has endured exceptional tragedy. His wife and his unborn child were murdered by the Manson family, But this movie reminded me of an earlier tragedy. When he was a boy in Poland, he was in a concentration camp during World War II. He was the only member of his family to escape, and he had to live on the street and hide his identity. He changed his name, he pretended to be Catholic, and he even became target practice for sadistic Nazis. There's a scene in the movie after Tchaikovsky finds a tooth in the wall where he needs to talk about this weird discovery, so he meets with a friend. And he says this, A tooth is a part of you, but if I lose a tooth, I say, me and my tooth. If I lose an arm, I say, me and my arm. If I lose both arms, do I say, me and my arms? How much can you cut away until I am no longer me? Polanski survived the concentration camps, And maybe that's where the self-hatred comes in. What did he need to become to survive? And what was left of him at the end? In 1948, the New Yorker published what would become one of the most popular short stories in the history of American fiction. But when it first came out, outraged readers canceled their subscriptions to the magazine. The author and the editor-in-chief received so much hate mail that the author had to publish a response to explain her story. It was, of course, a horror story. It was Shirley Jackson's The Lottery. Maybe it got people so angry because it doesn't start like your traditional horror story. It was set in a contemporary small New England village. Everybody is getting ready for the traditional harvest celebration. It's a sunny day, and we meet a bunch of the townsfolk, and it's very slice of life. 
This could be straight out of Thornton Wilder's Our Town. Until the lottery box is brought out. And then the children start collecting stones. And then their parents join them. Okay, do I need to give a spoiler alert for a story that is 69 years old? Each year in this village, every person enters the lottery. Whomever picks the paper with a black dot on it will become the human sacrifice that will ensure a good harvest. And when this story turned into the stoning of a woman, the readers of The New Yorker lost their minds. This story wasn't happening at Frankenstein's castle at night, and these villagers weren't an angry mob out to avenge a murdered child. These villagers were darn near democratic about the whole thing. And that's what's unsettling. There's rules to all of this. There's protocol. And each of these rules and protocols separates this from just being a brutal stoning by a mob, at least in the mob's mind. There are justifications for it. It is for the greater good. And the entire village agrees that it should happen. Shirley Jackson's The Lottery examines how people can justify doing horrible things if they're in a larger group of people that are doing the same horrible things. They don't see it as horrible. They see it as an unfortunate but necessary thing. Let's go back to that ancient village where the elders sit around the campfire and talk about in here and out there. The world is simple, us and them. So far, so good. But let's say someone in their tribe gets sick, like really sick, with a disease the village has never seen before. The sick person gets red boils on their skin. The villagers are worried, but they bring food and water to their sick brother. And then his family gets sick too. The children get the red boils, but it affects them worse. The children die. Now the village is very worried. They start arguing among themselves about whose turn it is to bring food and water to their sick brother. And then one of the children in another family gets a red boil on their arm. And just like that, out there is now in here too. How long do you think it would take for the village to agree on a greater good strategy? Do you think they ritualize the event to honor the sacrifice their fallen brother made? Do you think it became a campfire tale to honor and remember the dead? If so, what tone do you think the elders took to tell that story? In the lottery, the person who is going to become the outsider is really left up to blind chance. Everybody takes the risk. So maybe that makes throwing that stone easier. The thing is, the person who pulled the black spot is the exact same person they were five minutes before the lottery started. But they aren't, if the larger group thinks differently. They've been transformed through ritual and pageantry from insider to outsider. They are now a symbol of something, a stand-in for, well, whatever the group wants. And that's what's really scary in the lottery. You can become an outsider for arbitrary reasons. One minute you're a villager, and the next minute all the villagers are staring back at you. I think the ritual of the lottery probably started over some tragedy a long time ago that nearly wiped out the village. They had their version of the red boils on the sick. When things get bad enough, People look for extreme answers. And in James DeMonico's 2013 film, The Purge, things get bad enough. And the answer is very extreme. Just like the lottery, this movie takes place in a contemporary America. The year is 2022, but everything looks pretty much the same. And like the lottery, there's a yearly ritual with a yearly sacrifice. Except, this ritual is nationwide. For one 12-hour period, one night, every year, all crimes are made legal by the federal government. This is meant to allow a purge of the rage that naturally builds up in people. After purge night, you have 364 days to build up that rage again. 
Now, the movie doesn't tell us what happens if you do make a slip up and commit a crime outside of Purge Night, and I think it would have been interesting to know. The movie also doesn't tell us how bad it did get before this extreme answer was proposed. We just know that the country was on the brink of collapse from violence and poverty, and that a new government called the New Founding Fathers was put in place. But what we do know, and it's one of the most provocative ideas in the movie, is this. Since Purge Night started, unemployment is at 1%, crime is at an all-time low, and violent crimes barely exist. I find this very interesting to include because it means that the purge is working, at least in a statistics way. But it also works in the most important way. Everyone feels like it's working. And because of that, most of the nation supports it. There are a lot of ideas, little touches and tweaks that make the purge an interesting update to the lottery. First, the purge itself is completely optional. Not everybody purges because not everyone feels the need and not everyone supports the purge. And you're free to be unsupportive. You're free to voice your opinion. As a talk radio host says, everyone is entitled to their opinion and that's what makes this country great. However, if you live in the United States, you're still on the purge game board, no matter what your feelings about it might be. And the number of people who participate in the yearly purge is on the increase. I mentioned that in the lottery, there are rules and protocols in place that help the group feel that what they do has a solemn purpose. The ritual might be unfortunate, but it is necessary and for the greater good. And the purge is very clever in this way, because if you're still on the purge game board, that means there's a chance, even if it's a slim one, that you could become a sacrifice to the greater good. So there are ways you can show your support for the purge without purging. And you show your support with a symbol. If you put a vase of blue baptisias on your doorstep, it's a sign of support. It reminded me of keeping your porch light on during Halloween so you don't get egged, or putting lamb's blood on your doorposts. And the government normalizes all of this by having experts on television talk about it. And the history of the purge is taught in schools. And then there are the rules. Rules that are supposed to make you feel like they're kind of protecting you. Weapons of class four and below are authorized. Anything more lethal is restricted. So there. Emergency klaxons and the emergency broadcast system let you know it's time to get inside. Good to know. Oh, and government officials of ranking 10 and above are granted immunity. Immunity. And that immunity is what is really interesting here. The government is the only group that is completely off the purge game board. Now, I'll ask you, does that make them in here or out there? Just like the landlord in Roman Polanski's The Tenant, the new founding fathers don't need to do any cleaning up of the country or solve the unemployment problem. The citizens do it for them. If this was a prison, the citizens would be both the prisoners and the guards. As one might expect, the home security market is the new economy, which means that if you can pay for it, you can increase the odds that you and your family will stay safe. Of course, that means that the poor and the homeless are the easiest targets of the purge. The story follows James Sandon, a very successful home security salesman. He and his wife live in a wealthy enclave. We find out that all his neighbors are also his customers. Truth be told, they don't like him much because he flaunts his wealth. The security systems he sells are high-end. Thick metal panels slide over all the doors and windows and turn the homes into fortresses. The arming system comes with multiple cameras and a bank of closed-circuit televisions. Now, Sandin and his wife don't partake in the purge, but they do show their support with blue baptisias on the porch. Sandin is a guy who went from poverty to prosperity by riding the wave of security fear, so of course he supports it. But it is an uneasy support. 
When he talks to his family about keeping safe, he uses vague language like, I know bad things do happen tonight. When Sandin's young son asks why he and his mother don't purge, the two parents get a look that they normally reserve for being asked about sex. Sandin says, because we don't feel the need to, that's all. His son, who is a sensitive and scared kid, doesn't let it alone. So, if you felt the need to, you would kill someone tonight? That blunt wording makes Sandin very defensive. I know it's hard for someone your age to understand, but tonight allows people a release of all the rage they keep inside. You don't remember how bad it was. All the poverty, all the crime. This night saved the country. Now, telling the story from the point of view of the Sandin family is a smart move on the director's choice. You get to see a family that reluctantly supports something that affects them positively, even though they know it harms others. Sandin and his neighbors look at Purge Night as a minor inconvenience. But the other reason it's a smart move is because Sandin knows, and he has always known, that the sense of security his neighborhood has is false. His high-tech security systems are all illusions, there to make people feel like they are secure, like the emergency klaxons and putting flowers on your porch do. The security system looks good, it's strong, people stay away, but if someone really wants to get in the house, they can, because nothing is impenetrable. He might sell an illusion, but he also bought one of his own. He believed that things like the purge are not supposed to happen in his neighborhood. And this is where I think the movie misses a golden opportunity for real biting social commentary and real horror. As the movie stands, it's still a good horror movie. The family settles in for the night, but one of the hunted... A black homeless vet fights his way up the hill and into their elite neighborhood. The son takes pity on the man and drops the security system to let him into the house. Of course, this puts the father in the awkward position of having to have convictions. But it also puts the family in the crosshairs of a gang of rich, well-dressed, and well-mannered teens who want their prey, the vet, so that they may purge as they are entitled. If the Sandins don't give the vet over to them, they will add the family to their purging and do as they want. And, as the leader of the teenagers politely says, and we will want, as wanting is our will on this fine night. And this sets up a straw dogs type of siege film into play, with a few surprises sprinkled in. But back to the golden opportunity that was missed. By taking the path the movie chooses, which is the neighborhoods of the haves gets infiltrated by one of the have-nots who brings a purge with him, it kind of misses a point. I don't think anybody needed to bring the purge. I think the purge was alive and well on that street of mansions already. While these people are locking out the world with their big metal doors, they are also locking themselves inside with their families. What if you lock yourself inside to find out you are the outsider within your own home? And Purge Night makes all crimes legal for 12 hours. Teen angst could have a body count. A midlife crisis could have a body count. Not putting the toilet seat down could have a body count. Who needs a messy divorce court? One of the neighbors is having a house party with his friends. What if the party was really a trap to kill off the competition? Or what if one of the people invited to the party thought it was a trap and killed the hosts over nothing? If the entitled people kill the entitled people because the government says they are entitled to do it, what would the new founding fathers do then? Horror is, by its nature, an outsider art form. It lends itself to observation and discussion of the outsider because it allows for a visceral exploration of what makes us human, both the good parts 
and the bad parts of us. Remember when I asked if you identified with a Frankenstein monster when you were a kid? I've never heard anyone say that they identified with the angry mob of villagers. And yet, somebody must be the villager. Good horror examines the fear and the anxiety that comes from being an outsider. And good horror also examines how, very often, outsiders are created by the village. And sometimes, good horror makes us stop and question whether we're the outsider or the villagers. And thanks for listening to my show. I'd love to hear back from you. You can email me directly at scott at hellbentforhorror.com. And I've also updated my Hellbent for Horror website, hellbentforhorror.com. You can download every episode directly from there, read any newsletters, and you can go to any of my social websites and emails all from the homepage. You can IM me on my Facebook page at facebook.com forward slash hellbentforhorror. And you can find me on Twitter at hellbenthorror. A lot of the great conversations I have with fans happens on Twitter at hellbenthorror. Now, for you, the listeners of Hellbent for Horror, Audible is offering a free audiobook download with a free 30-day trial to give you the opportunity to check out their service. To download your free audiobook today, go to audibletrial.com forward slash hellbentforhorror. If you like the show and you're curious about audiobooks, sign up for the service through Hellbent for Horror. It helps make this podcast sustainable for me. I thank you in advance. And thank you for listening, folks. Hellbent for Horror was written and broadcast by me, S.A. Bradley, and produced by me and Lisa Gorski. You can now subscribe to the Hellbent for Horror podcast on iTunes, Google Play, Player FM, and Stitcher. And if you like the show, please consider writing a review on iTunes or Stitcher or Google Play. It really helps. Till next time, stay hell-bent.